You choose whether you're committed or whether you're lazy. You choose whether you're diligent or whether you're haphazard. You choose today whether you perform the Lord's work with excellence or with negligence. These are all choices. Amen? But these choices result in habits being formed, either good or bad. So Daniel chapter 6, and we'll start at verse 4. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the lion's den. Verse 9. Wherefore King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being wide open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetimes. Um, I've called this message this morning, What type of habits have you established? What type of habits have you established? You know, there's a lot of things in life, I'm sure you would agree, that we have no control over. Would you agree? Um, naturally, you do not choose the family that you're born into. Um, you don't choose your own gender, despite what the liberals say. Amen? Amen. You don't choose your date of birth. Um, you don't choose your looks. Maybe you can mess about with your looks a little bit and have a few surgeries and put a few injections into you, but you don't choose your how you look. You don't choose the color of your eyes. Amen? You don't choose how tall you are or how small you are. And I could go on, etc., etc., etc. Well, spiritually, it's the same. While Christians can argue over the degree of the sovereignty of God in our salvation, um, and by the way, I believe in the sovereignty of God, we cannot deny that God comes to us when we couldn't come to where he, He was. Amen? Um. All sane theologians agree that we do not choose our spiritual giftings, our talents, or opportunities. God does. Um, The fact that you're even here this morning is a divine appointment. Every time that you come under the sound of God's voice is a divine appointment. And it's a very sobering thing. But... um, I'm sure we would also all agree that God calls different people to different tasks. Not everybody here this morning is called to do the same thing. Just like the body is diverse, so is God's people. But I have a question. Why is it that one person seems to have more impact in what they're doing than the other person? I honestly believe, and this is where man's responsibility comes in, I believe a lot of things in life boil down to choices. Even within the kingdom of God. And I'm talking about discipline here. I'm talking about spiritual discipline when it comes to the call that God has has upon your life. Um, Through reading this book, through observing God's people over the years, I'm convinced that a lot... 
of who we are and what we are results from establishing godly habits that cause a believer to get into a disciplined routine. I'm going to say that again. I am convinced that a lot of who we are and what we are is a result of establishing godly habits that cause a believer to get into a disciplined routine. Let me say this. You will go as deep with God as you want to go. Amen? You know, we've talked about a few weeks in Ezekiel's prophecy about the waters up to the ankle, waters up to the knee, waters up to the waist, waters to swim in. But I'm telling you, when it comes to the the deep things of God, you can swim in those deep waters. Would you agree? You can be as studious in that book as you want to be. Amen? You can be as neglectful of this book as you want to be. But that, that carries over to every single Christian responsibility in this book. We're not clones. We're not robots. We're all unique. We're all unique. That's why there's times God would say, choose you this day. This way or that way. Um, as Elijah was a prime example of this. Choose. You have a choice today of the person that you want to be or, or what you want to do. You choose whether you're committed or whether you're lazy. You choose whether you're diligent or whether you're haphazard. You choose today whether you perform the Lord's work with excellence or with negligence. These are all choices. Amen? But these choices result in habits being formed, either good or bad. Pastors across the board lament over the drastic change that has occurred in the attitude of many Christians since COVID-19. Honestly, COVID-19, regardless of your opinions on it, whatever, it happened and people were forced to respond to it in some way. Would you agree? We were faced with a situation where everyone had to respond to it. Well, what has resulted from this throughout the world is a spirit of apathy has taken a hold of the church. I talk to pastors in Europe. I talk to pastors in America. And honestly, the church has not recovered from COVID-19. I talked to somebody in this last week and they're not in church. And I'm like, I said, well, hey, we've missed you in church. And, you know, and I meant it. And he said, well, you know, I'm, what are you, I'm, not, I'm just not sure about this whole COVID thing. And I'm like, you know, really? Like, it, I, what I'm saying is it was a test. It was a test for the church. Was it going to change who they were? Or for the better, for the worse, or were they just going to remain the same? Everything in life happens for a reason, okay? Um, but through COVID, I believe people's faith was te- tested. I believe their discipline was tested. Their commitment was tested. Their loyalty was tested. Their respect of authority was tested. After all, every single one person become a medical expert overnight. Amen? I guess like, uh, try being a pastor through that when everybody's an expert. And I'm telling you, the only thing I knew is the more I knew, the less I knew. You, you listen to 10 doctors on Fox News and they were going 10 different directions. You listen to 10 on CNN, they're going 10 different directions. And I'm saying, if they don't know, how am I supposed to know? I'm just being honest. Okay? But I, I want to dive deeper into this subject of habits. Okay? That's why I've called this message this morning. What type of habits have you established? So I checked some of the online dictionaries to verify what a habit really is. And here's some of the main definitions that I found. A habit is something that you do often and regularly, sometimes without knowing that you're doing it. Amen? That's right. A habit is a settled or regular tendency or practice, especially one that is hard to give up. 
A habit is an established inclination or usual manner of behavior. A habit is an acquired mode of conduct that has become nearly or completely involuntary. Anybody got habits here? Anybody not got habits? Good or bad? Okay. It is a natural fact that we all are creatures of habit. Now, I'm talking about good and bad, okay? Um, Most people tend to have both. And I'm sure if I was around you for a few days, I would start to pick up on some of your bad habits. Amen? Just in case you say, well, I've got no bad habits. And I can tell you what, probably if you think that, you're probably not married. Because whenever, whenever you get married, you start to realize there's things that you do that are annoying. Amen? Um, and that's part of marriage. God brings a couple together so that they have to learn to die to self. Okay? So, I'm sure if we're honest this morning, we would all admit we struggle with bad habits. Some of them have subconsciously been there since we were children. I'm not joking. Um, some of these are minor. Some of them are serious. Most of the time, we don't even think about them. We just do them by default. Um, Hopefully, we all have good habits, especially spiritual habits. Um, How do you think Amazon and the merchants out, out there online determine how to entice you to buy stuff? How do they do that? How do they dangle that carrot in front of you whenever you go online? They have you profiled. They know more about you than you realize. And do you know what they've learned? They've learned we're all creatures of habit. We have our likes. We have our dislikes. Um, There is a mountain of information on you out there in the world wide web. Um, They have information on your viewing habits and on your spending habits. Uh, They know what gets a hook into you. They know what doesn't work. That's why they keep fine-tuning it until it's like, why do they keep throwing that their thing up? Well, they keep throwing that thing up because they know you like it. Does that make sense? Okay. They use whatever it takes to lure you into buying stuff. They know where you spend, when you spend, and how you spend. By the way, the devil's like that. You need to realize the devil's a strategist. Uh, He picks his victims, he picks his moments, he picks his temptations. Why does he keep tempting you with the same things? It works. With the amount of information the devil possesses on your family tree, the amount of information he has accumulated on you over the years... He can have a pretty effective attack upon you. Would you agree? What I'm saying is, the devil is stupid, okay? But he's, he's not completely stupid, okay? He's stupid because he thought that he could be like the Most High. How foolish was that? But he is a strategist. He has a plan. And he has a plan for each of us. And he just hits us until something works. When we think of bad habits, we often think of alcohol cigarettes or pornography but there are many many bad natural habits that we have it could be picking your nose it could be biting your nails um, sometimes we don't exercise enough um, sometimes we don't discipline our eating um, we spend too much money on foolish things um, we don't use our time wisely um, In this modern age, we spend too much time on our cell phones, on television, on our laptops, iPads, iPods, whatever I whatever I you have. Um, But people are addicted to things like Facebook. They're addicted to social media. They're addicted to gaming. They're addicted to sport. They're addicted to politics. I'm telling you, whatever your interest is today. 
there's a lot of people with a lot of bad habits. And it's so easy to feed your flesh today. Would you agree? It's never been a better day to feed your flesh. Just It's just so accessible today. Now, I'm not here to give you a hard time today. Um, we've all got silly habits, okay? So I have a confession for you today. I've got a bad habit. Well, I've got quite a few, okay? But I have a bad habit. I'm going to let you into one of my bad habits. And that bad habit has been there since I was a child. And that bad habit is sucking my little pinky. I'm telling you, I get on the computer. Um, you can put the, this here on. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm on the computer. I'm working away. And then whenever I'm at my thinking time, I stick my little pinky. And you can look at my, my, like my kids think my pinkies are deformed. They're, they're full of calluses, whatever. But it's not that I try to do that. It's not like I get up in the morning and say, right, I'm going to suck my pinky today. <laughs> and I'm preparing this sermon yesterday, and guess what I'm doing as I'm preparing the sermon? Whenever I'm pondering, I'm sucking my pinky, and I'm like, I've been doing that from I was a child. My mom, whenever I was in church, she didn't believe in pacifiers. Do you know what her pacifier was? Her little pinky. So in case you think... <laughs> Why did she not just give me a pacifier and I would have got over it? <laughs> That's what I'm thinking anyway. But anyway, no, but you see people still suck their thumbs. Like, I think that looks really funny whenever an adult's sucking their thumb. But I don't think a pinky's as bad as that. But I'm just letting you know. I'm letting you know that it is really easy to get into a bad habit. And it's really hard to get out of a bad habit. Would you agree? The amount of time, every time I could be watching TV... And I stick my finger in my, my mouth whenever I'm watching. And the kids are like, Daddy, stop that. Stop that. And I'm like, okay, sorry, sorry. Didn't realize I was doing it. And I'm not telling lies. I'm literally, it's like, maybe it's just a, a soothing thing or whatever. But when we came to Walt Hill, we got into the habit of putting the key under a brick. Okay? We, would just, we just did it. And we didn't even think about it, you know. And by the way, we don't do it anymore, just in case you're thinking of breaking into our house today. <laughs> we don't do that anymore. Okay. But one day, I got into such a habit, um, I went and lifted the brick one day, and there was a big, ginormous plastic key. I'm like, I didn't put that plastic key there. It was one of these big, long plastic keys. And I knew Jen hadn't put it there. So, of course, we had to have an investigation in the house. It so happened that Daniel, this is back when he was about three or two, <laughs> Daniel had watched us doing this thing so much that he thought it was the right thing to do. So I don't even know what the key was for, but he stuck it under. Now, that tells me that our habits don't just affect us. Our habits can affect those around us. Amen? Here's one more that some of you know. that I, When I came to Nebraska, I had the bad habit of when there was always people coming up and they were looking at me. So I would just, I had, I had a pair of rubber boots. It was handy for me rather than tie my shoes and run out and whatever. I just put the, these rubber boots on, whether it was summer, or winter, autumn or springtime. I would just run out there and talk to people and then come in again, throw my rubber boots off. Well, what did Daniel start to do as he started to grow up? I would see in the middle of summer, like it's 90 degrees out there. And there's Daniel outside walking about in his rubber boots. I'm like, that's scary. That's scary. Like I did that as a shortcut. And I got into the habit of it. I didn't even think about it. I wouldn't, like, you know what it's like. Somebody comes, you don't want to just tie your shoes up and go out. But I'm telling you, we are all creatures of habit. Whether we like it or not, whether we want to admit it or not. And don't look at me as if I'm the only one that has a really bad habit, okay? You're all shaking your heads as if that's terrible that he sucks his finger. But most habits we gravitate toward occur through repetition. Amen? Some of that is conscious and some of it is subconscious. Some of the habits we take from others that we respect, some of them we just get into a habit, a routine. And they say if you do something for 20, 28 days, it becomes a habit. It takes 28 days to form a habit. And by the way, 
habits aren't always bad, okay? Um, some habits actually occur through good discipline training. Um, for example, when I was a police officer, they kept repeating drills and disciplines in our training until they become an established habit. Um, and it was so that we lived in a terrorist situation, so they would repeat things and it got so boring. Like, oh, here we have to do this and this drill again. And we would do it. Like for months, our training was constantly just repetitive. You know, you do this drill, you do that drill, whether it was with um, weapons, whether it was just with ordinary response to, like if we come under attack or whatever it was. But I can tell you what happened then whenever you come out onto the street was that when some, an incident happened, you robotically responded to it in a disciplined way. So instead of panicking whenever there was a bomb or, or somebody was shooting or somebody was killed, instead of panicking and going to bits, you just kicked into this habit. They used to give you a weapon. As soon as you got the weapon, you were not allowed to handle that weapon until you did three things. Cock, look, lock and look. Okay? Now, Steve has had a weapons thing where he'll give people weapons and I'm looking at people. They're not even checking the weapon to see is there a bullet in it. I'm just saying generally. But for me, whether it was with Steve's event or whether it was something back when I was a police officer, if you handed me a weapon, Jesse, the first thing I did was cock, lock and look. Because you didn't want to shoot somebody accidentally. Amen? So I'm telling you, that became who I was. Nobody had to tell me, like, every day, you need to do this. You need to cock, lock, and look. It was like, if somebody didn't cock, lock, and look, guess what? They mightn't be too long in uniform. Because they would say, you're not disciplined. You're not getting this here. You are a threat to your colleagues. So there's good habits, and there's bad habits that uh, we get into. Um, I'll tell you another couple of habits when I was a police officer. Every single morning, I checked under my car. I would check under my car for booby trap bombs. We lost quite a number of police officers, quite a lot of soldiers, quite a lot of prison officers through a, a mercury tilt bomb being put under the driver's seat of, a, of somebody who was in the security forces. So every morning I would get check under my car. That was the first thing I did before I put a seatbelt on. I would check under my car. But I also put my seatbelt on out of habit. And I, I, put, I checked under my car through habit to save my life. I put my seatbelt on because you had to, okay? Not because I wanted to, okay? Sometimes, I, I'm old enough to remember the days whenever you didn't need seatbelts, okay? Anybody else remember that? The good old days? <laughs> you could just, like, just sit there and enjoy the journey and no seatbelt. But, and I, by the way, I'm not making a statement there. It, it, it definitely saves lives. And I'll tell you, as a police officer, I remember dealing with, in like 3 o'clock in the morning, a car accident. Four young men, 17 and 18 years of age, in that car. The two guys in the front had seatbelts on. The two guys in the back, this guy was killed. The other guy got 72 stitches in his head. His head was cracked open. So I'm not making a statement against seatbelts, okay? Because seatbelts definitely save lives. So we're talking about habits this morning. But for the Christian, they should have holy habits they should get into patterns that are righteous so that they do it automatically. When it comes to our Christian walk, the Holy Spirit will expose our weak points, our detrimental characteristics, and harmful habits. And I want to say this morning as I'm preaching, I don't need to mention 5,000 bad habits that Christians have for the Holy Spirit to speak. What happens is when you get onto a subject like this and the Holy Spirit is speaking, then God can just put his finger on something that's been in your life and that he doesn't want. It could be a, somewhere where you're not disciplined, somewhere where you're apathetic, somewhere where you've got lazy. The Holy Spirit has the ability to do that. Amen? By the way, do you ever wonder why God has to keep repeating things to you?
we have a habit of repeating the same mistake. We say, I'm done with that. I'm never going to do that again. Twelve days later, we're back to the same old, same old. Or it's a new year, it's a fresh start. I'm going to be more committed to God, more committed to the house of God, more committed to the work of God. And then we just lose it. We don't get into a habit for long enough so that it just becomes who we are. But be encouraged this morning. If you did not have the Holy Spirit, you would not even desire to please God. And please know this, if you didn't have the Holy Spirit, then you would not be able to overcome that sin that you don't like. So he, he gives you a hatred of that sin, and then he gives you the ability to overcome that sin. And as you do that repeatedly and constantly, you get into the habit of being victorious in your Christian walk. The reason why people are up and down on the same things is because they haven't conquered it. And by the way, that's all of us. There's things I could point out in your life that I've got a victory over, but you could also do the same to me. Amen? See, whenever you're fixated on changing the other person, you're not fixated on getting yourself sorted out. You need to get into holy habits and... There are things that need to be removed in your life. There are things that need to be put into your life. And creating good habits requires discipline and dedication. Basically, know what God wants for you and then do it. Again, do it for long enough and it becomes a holy habit. I think as Christians we have a, a habit of thinking sin only refers to the things we commit. But it also describes the things that we omit to do. Okay? So that's important. And that could be anything from reading your Bible to not praying, not witnessing enough, or not coming to church. And we need to understand that what we do and what we do not do are a result of habits. For example, some of you used to come to Bible study on a Tuesday night. Now you don't. What happened? You got into a bad habit. Some of you used to come to the prayer meeting. Now you don't. What happened? You got into a bad habit. Some of you used to come to the cater on a Sunday night. Now you don't. What happened? You got into a bad habit. Some of you used to be early to church. Now you're not. What happened? You got into a bad habit. Amen? Honestly, what, here's the worst thing. Whenever you get into a bad habit, you start blaming everybody but yourself. Uh, seriously. You know, even at this time of the year, if you want an excuse at this time of the year to not be in church, you can get one. Would you agree? Like everybody at the moment is flat out. It's like we're running from one place to another to another. Like we had a graduation Friday night. Then we had a party Saturday. Then today. I'm telling you, it's busy season. We're all busy. But I'm telling you that there's also habits that if you have them, you will be in the house of God because that is your habit. You've, you've got a habit. Some people, it's smoking. Some people, it's pornography. But you can have a habit for being in the house of God. Are you with me this morning? So, McKenna mentioned a passage this morning, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Bad company corrupts good morals. How's your company? Who you get around is who you become like. And I want to talk to the young people this morning because a lot of the time, young people choose their friends by... Who's the coolest kid on the block? They want to be with this kid. But that's not always the wisest choice. For single people in this church, what are you actually looking in a partner? You know, is godly characteristics the overriding thing that you're looking? Or does he need to have a good personality? Or does she need to have a good personality? Or a sexy body? Or what is it? What are we looking for? And 
ultimately, I don't even know why I got onto that, by the way. <laughs> but bad company corrupts good morals. Get the right person in your life who's going to facilitate you going in the right way. So what I'm basically saying is, you marry somebody who's got bad habits on this, they could end up taking you down a wrong road. Amen? I see it happening. There's people that used to be in church and they're not in church because they married a spouse that doesn't believe in going to church. Huh? It can happen really quick. So what is God putting his finger on in your life at the moment? What bad habit, and don't tell me you don't have them, what bad habit is he exposing? What is he trying to get you to change? Um, remember this, sanctification is essentially you trading your bad habits for good habits. Amen? Yeah. Sanctification is becoming more like Jesus. Okay? So what happens in sanctification is when we come to the Lord, we're coming to him with a lot of junk. A lot of wrong attitudes, a lot, lot of wrong feelings in our heart, a lot of bad behavior. Can you think about it? Somebody comes to the Lord and they've been living in sin for 50 years. There's a lot of unraveling has to happen. Would you agree? That's why it's, thank God for these young people that have encountered the, law, the Lord at a young age. Because there's less junk to be unraveled. But whatever age you're at, whenever you come to the Lord, He starts a process of removing the junk, getting rid of all the junk, all the attitudes, all the... It could be hurts. It could be failures. You know, there's people carry their failures for years. There's people carry their hurts for years. And they never get healed from their hurts. They never get free of their failures. Brother, sister, when you come to Christ, He cleans the slate. Amen? You're a clean slate, so he can now start adding things into your life. Um, R.C. Sproul defines sanctification as this. It is a continuing change worked by God in us, freeing us from sinful habits and forming in us Christ-like affections, dispositions, and virtues. It does not mean that sin is instantly eradicated, but it also more than a counteraction in which sin is merely restrained or repressed without being progressively destroyed. Sanctification is a real transformation, not just the appearance of one. End of quote. Brother, sister, if you allow yourself to go through God's process, there are habits that will have to go, there are relationships that will have to be abandoned, there are attitudes that will have to change. That's a fact. Um, the opposite of a disciplined man or woman of God is a lazy, slothful servant. Now, I don't need to tell you what the Bible says about slothful people and about a slothful servant. But I want, I want to basically tell you, God has no time for slothful people. Amen? Amen? Jesus calls the believer that makes heaven a faithful servant. He calls the religious person a slothful servant. Being faithful suggests being disciplined and obedient, and it represents who a child of God is. Being slothful denotes laziness or disobedience and indicates one being a child of the devil. Let me just share something. It's not hard to work out. You've got a flesh and you've got a spirit. When you default to your flesh, it's ugly. It's selfish. It's sinful. It's grieving to, to the Lord. When you default to your spiritual man and to the, the promptings of the Spirit of God, it's beautiful. It's no longer about you. It's about Him. So on this side, you've got your spiritual man. It's all about Him. On this side, you've got your natural man and it's all about him, all about yourself. Yeah. Well, I don't feel or I think this. I, this is my opinion. Who cares? Honestly, everybody's got an opinion today on everything. Yeah. I'm not, not just COVID-19. Just uh, They have an opinion on everything out there. And honestly, the thing that really matters, 
They have no opinion on. They don't want to talk about God's Word. They don't want to talk about the Great Commission. They don't want to talk about why they're here. Brother, sister, why do we not want to talk about the things of God today? The things of this world is more appealing to them than the things of God's Word. What's the problem? They're backslidden. People are backslidden, but they put a facade on of, well, I'm. how are you doing, brother? Oh, doing great, brother. God bless you. But it's, it's all a show. I think, I, I feel it more when I came to America. Everybody has to put on a fake smile as if they're doing wonderful when inside they're struggling. Brother, sister, we struggle at times. There's times we need others to just come and wrap their arm around us and say, would you, would you just pray with me? Amen? I'm telling you, it's time to be real. That's what I'm saying. See all that phony nonsense? It, it's not the Holy Ghost. Because how do I know? Because God's real. When we're putting on a show that everything's fine, we're just being deceptive. When we're saying, oh, we're doing good and all this, we're telling lies. And then we wonder why the Spirit's grieved, wonder why we don't have a passion for the things of God. And it's like, you're just an actor on a stage. And I'm not going to have anything to do with that. Go ahead. You can do that for 30 years. I'm not being part of that. And then we wonder, why can I not feel the presence of God? Well, it's not that God has completely left you or abandoned you. What it is, He's saying, I'm not going to be part of your show. You can walk up and down this catwalk all you want, and you can put on a show to everybody that everything's hunky-dory, and underneath your heart broken. Your, your heart's heavy. You're, you've lost your passion for the things of God. That, that to me is hell on earth. Do you know it takes real effort to be an actor on a stage? But you see, to be yourself, it doesn't take any effort. Just, just to say, hey, Ron, would you pray with me today? I'm struggling. It's not liberating. Oh, well, I'm the pastor. I don't want Ron to think that I'm struggling today. Pride. 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 And I'm telling you, if we were honest before the brethren more, I think we would experience more victories. Honestly, I, over the years, maybe haven't been a, a police officer and a pastor, you pick up when people are struggling. You pick up when they're backslidden. You pick up on it. I'm sure you're the same. You've got the Holy Spirit. Um, you start to see patterns, okay? And you see the consequences of those that have got, are, are very disciplined in their Christian walk. You see that? You see this, and then you watch what it produces. Then you see this when people are, are totally lazy and ap apathetic and unreal. And you see what it produces. Like over this last couple of weeks, I bumped into a, a lady I hadn't seen in years. Okay? Well, the last time I seen her, she was just putting on a religious facade and she was just, it was hard to listen to her and it was hard to be around her. Okay? It was all like fake. Have you ever been around anybody like that? Huh? Well, guess what? I met her in this last couple of weeks and guess what? She was still the same. I'm like, do you understand? But what does that produce? That, that, that would kill me just to put on a facade. I'm just telling you, we need to be real. Amen? We need to get into holy habits of just being real, just not trying to put on something to impress people or put on a show. And by the way, it's important to know this, that when it comes to spiritual growth, it's important for you to realize that your flesh will react to what God is asking you to do. So if God is telling you to go north, your flesh will tell you to go south. A lot of the times people, when it's a sermon like this, people say, oh, the pastor said this. Well, I'm not going to listen to him. I'm like, okay. Yeah, th this, I thought this message up this morning. I thought it was, I'm going to put Ron right today. It's time for me to put Ron right. Do you know what? If that was my motive, that's the day that he wouldn't turn up in church. Seriously. 
I'm telling you, you need to recognize the, the Word of God for what it is, the Spirit of God for who He is, and learn to respond to what God is actually putting His finger upon. The, the, the Lord doesn't shoot, in soccer terms, the Lord doesn't shoot over the bar. He puts the ball in the net. He knows where you are today. He knows what you're struggling today. He knows what the issue in your heart is today. And He knows what your strengths are. He knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. So it's really, really, really smart to actually listen to Him, what He's actually saying today. Um... This brings me to my passage this morning. He said, about time. But I said all this to say this. If you want a good example of a disciplined man of God who had holy habits in the Old Testament, you might want to study the life of Daniel. Daniel was a faithful man of God. His character was beyond reproach. We've seen it in our reading this morning. Um, he did not let the wicked laws of man define who he was and what he did. I'm telling you that even though when it comes to a lot of laws, we are subject to the law of this land, when it comes to spiritual things, God calls the shots. We've seen it. And what I love about the passage in um, Daniel chapter 6, verse 10 was, what was well? First of all, um, there's that passage. He went and gave thanks unto his God as he did aforetime. That's what the King James says. The New King James says, "As was his custom from early days." So they come out with this newfangled liberal law. Okay, you're not allowed to talk to your God unless the king gives you permission. What do you? Th- how do you think Daniel responded to that? Really? Yeah. Go and jump, Darius. If you think I'm going to bow down to your foolish laws, I'm not going to. Because God, God's law overrides your law. But you know what I love about this story? And maybe I'm just imagining Daniel, okay, the laws come in. He could have prayed into himself, couldn't he? He says, you know, for this next 30 days, I'm just going to pray quietly into myself. You know, Lord. Could he have done that or not? Why did he not? He, that what he had a he had a, a good habit, that he wasn't going to break for man or beast or demon. But you know what I love about it is, it talks here. He said his windows were wide open. I'm like he could have closed his windows. Would you agree? If that was most Christians today, he says, you know, I don't agree with that law, but you know what? I'm going to close these windows. I'm just going to pray away and they're not going to hear me. <laughs> but he didn't, even, he didn't even go there. I'm like, that's how bold he was. Amen. That's how much he loved his Lord. And it's like, this is my habit. Nobody's going to change me. Amen. That wasn't stubbornness. That was boldness. That was God saying, keep going. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. And I'm telling you one thing that when God... When God arrests you, that is more important than anything that man can say or anything that man can do. But honestly, I'm thinking that and I'm saying, if it was me, I'd have probably kept praying, but I'd have probably closed the windows. I'm being honest with you. I'm being honest with you. I think, you know, I I, I don't think I would have prayed into myself, but I would have, I would have continued the praying, but I think I'd have probably closed the windows. I'm just being honest. I'm like, you know, I don't need the hassle. I don't want to deal with these clowns out there. I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to continue praying. God's called me to pray. I'm going to continue praying. Not Daniel. Daniel's, no, this is the way I do it. And You know, Daniel had a compulsive habit. Prayed three times a day. What a mighty man. Daniel didn't just do this to be difficult or rebellious, by the way. This is who he was, and this is what he did. You know, I want to talk just for a few moments about our greatest example, Jesus Christ. Um, 
Jesus Christ is the ultimate example for us. Um, I want to tell you something. Do you know that he attended the synagogue regularly, habitually, when when there was church? Um, Luke chapter 4 verse 16 says, and puts it well, that he, Jesus, came, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, or as was his habit, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. I want to say this for, for those of you who think being in the house of the Lord on Sunday is optional. It wasn't optional for Jesus. Now, whose footsteps are we meant to walk in? I'm telling you, you, I hear, you go online today, you'll get all this, why you don't need to be in church on a Sunday, and that's legalism. Baloney. We're walking in his footsteps. When church was on, he was there. Amen? We're meeting, we're fellowshipping together today. Again, that word was, he was in the synagogue, as was his habit. His habit was to be there. And by the way, do you think he was late for church? Not like a lot of Christians today. I, I don't know. I just I, It's beyond me how people habitually are late for the house of God. That it, It's a terrible habit. It's a bad habit. It's teaching your kids and your grandkids bad habits. And I'm just saying it's wrong. Um, I never was brought up with that. Thank God I was brought up with Christian parents. Not only were in the house of God in time, but they were at the prayer meeting. That's all I remember. My memories from a child were my parents were always in the house of prayer. They were always in church in time. I, I don't honestly remember my dad being late for church. I'm being honest. And I, I have been late for church for... Um, there's times I've had to go to pray for people. Um, there's times I've had to let Kyle know that um, maybe I was doing something with the school, like coaching with the school, and I was running late. There's times There's times. maybe a child can get sick at the last minute. Amen? So I'm not talking about that. Or somebody's coming to church and they get a flat tire. Okay? That can happen. I'm not talking about rare, isolated incidents. But I'm saying, what's your habit when it comes to the things of God? Are you like Daniel? It's, it's so robotic. It's so. It's become, you've been doing it for so long that what you do is who you are. Um, this is a big subject this morning. David said in Psalm 122, 1, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. That should be the cry of every one of us this morning. Amen? When God's house is open, we should be there. Um. By the way, I'm trying to encourage you this morning as well. So, I mean, this sword, um, it lifts us up. It challenges us. That's the beautiful thing about the Word of God. God's truth, it does both to us at the same time. So it can be exposing the junk. Thank God for Him exposing the junk. But it also can be encouraging us in the things we're doing right. So, as we come to an end of this message, in fact, I'll... I'll ask you the question that I started with this morning. What type of habits have you established? What type of habits have you established? Are they good habits? Are they bad habits? And if the Holy Ghost has put his finger on some bad habits, are you willing to change? Let us pray. I'm going to be honest this morning. I don't know why I've had to preach on this subject. Um, I don't even need to know why. The only thing I need to know is that I've released what He has laid upon my heart. I want you just to examine your own heart this morning. I'm not asking for anyone to raise their hand this morning. I would just like you to ask yourself just some of these important questions this morning. Ultimately, the preacher should not have to do an A to Z to get you to be convicted. Uh, that's, that's the work of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit knows you better than the preacher knows you. 
The Holy Spirit knows you better than you know yourself. You only think you know yourself. I mean, that's one thing about getting older. You start to realize that, why do I do that? Why do I do that? You, start, you don't even know why you do things sometimes. You habitually do it, and, and it's like, that needs to change. That needs to stop. And I'm telling you, we're all in that process of sanctification that will only reach its full and perfect conclusion when we see Jesus. Amen? He is our perfect righteousness. But I'm telling you, He is in sanctification. He's stripping you. Maybe today there's something in your life that needs addressed once and for all. You may have done it for 300 years. Well, it's time for it to go. Amen? Oh, well, my dad did that. And my grandfather did that. And my great-grandfather did that. Who cares? It's a new day. It's a new opportunity. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the life that comes from your word. We thank you for the wisdom that comes from your word. We thank you for the, the joy that results from your word and the peace that comes. Lord, we want to be faithful to you, Lord. Lord, in a day of apathy, Lord, even in an apathetic day for the church generally, I pray that we would waken up and, Lord, we would be who we're meant to be and do what we're meant to do. And, Lord, we pray this in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.